Level zero, you're standing on solid ground right now, breathing air, watching clouds drift by like everything's perfectly normal. You probably think planets are supposed to be like this, solid, stable, habitable. Here's the truth. Earth is the weirdo, the cosmic outlier, the one planet in our solar system that didn't completely screw up the assignment. And even then, we barely passed. Terrestrial planets like Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury are rocky, dense, and relatively tiny. They're the runts of the planetary litter, huddled close to the sun like kids around a campfire. Metal cores wrapped in layers of rock may be topped with a thin atmospheric frosting if they're lucky. Earth got the golden ticket. Liquid water, a magnetic field that actually works, and an atmosphere that doesn't actively try to kill you. Venus turned into a pressure cooker from hell. Mars lost its atmosphere and became a frozen wasteland. Mercury is basically a sun-blasted cinder with delusions of grandeur. We think of Earth as normal because it's all we've ever known. But in the grand cosmic lottery of planetary types, we're not even close to typical. We're at the tutorial level. The training wheels before the universe shows you what it's really capable of. But if you think Venus is bad, you haven't seen anything yet. Because some planets didn't just fail at habitability, they declared war on the very concept of survival. Level 1. Let's talk about worlds that looked at habitability and said, no thanks. Venus should have been our twin. Similar size, similar composition, just one planet closer to the sun. Instead, it became a masterclass in planetary nightmare fuel. Surface temperature, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. Atmospheric pressure, 90 times Earth's, enough to crush you like a soda can under a hydraulic press. And the clouds, sulfuric acid. The rain, also sulfuric acid, though it never reaches the ground because it evaporates in the scorching hellscape below. But Venus is just warming up. Enter the hot Jupiters and suddenly Venus looks like a pleasant vacation spot. These are gas giants the size of Jupiter that somehow ended up orbiting closer to their stars than Mercury orbits our sun. We're talking temperatures exceeding 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, winds screaming at thousands of miles per hour, and weather systems so violent, they make Earth's hurricanes look like a gentle summer breeze. HD 189733B takes this to another level. The winds there hit 5,400 miles per hour. That's seven times the speed of sound. And it rains glass, sideways. Molten glass whipping through the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds, shredding anything that could theoretically exist there. The planet is tidally locked, one side permanently facing its star in eternal blazing daylight, while the other side freezes in permanent darkness. These planets shouldn't exist according to our early models. Gas giants need to form far from their stars where it's cold enough for ice to accumulate. Yet here they are, locked in a deadly embrace with their suns, their atmospheres slowly being stripped away into space like cosmic cotton candy in a blowtorch. You think sideways glass rain is extreme? Wait until you meet the planets where the weather is so cold, so alien, that diamonds literally fall from the sky. Level 2. Way out in the suburbs of our solar system, where the sun looks like just another bright star and temperatures plunge to negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit, lurk Uranus and Neptune. These aren't your standard gas giants. They're ice giants, though calling them ice is about as accurate as calling lava spicy water. They're not made of ice as you know it. Instead, they're packed with what astronomers politely call ices. Compressed, superheated slushies of water, methane, and ammonia existing in states of matter that don't have convenient names. These substances are under such crushing pressure that they form bizarre hybrid states, simultaneously solid and liquid, conducting electricity through layers thousands of miles thick. Neptune's winds are the fastest in the solar system, screaming across its blue surface at 1,200 miles per hour. That's faster than the speed of sound on Earth. And remember, this is happening in a world so far from the sun that sunlight is barely a whisper. The energy driving these apocalyptic winds comes from deep inside the planet itself, some internal heat source we still can't fully explain. Uranus is tilted on its side at a 98-degree angle, rolling around the sun like a cosmic bowling ball. Scientists think something massive, probably planet-sized, smacked into it billions of years ago. This means Uranus experiences seasons that last 21 years each. Each pole gets four decades of continuous sunlight followed by four decades of total darkness. But here's where these ice giants get truly unhinged. Deep inside, the pressure and temperature are so extreme that scientists believe carbon gets compressed into diamonds. Massive diamonds, some potentially the size of cities, slowly sinking toward the core through an ocean of liquid metallic hydrogen. It's literally raining diamonds on Neptune. At least these frozen monsters still have a sun to orbit. But out there in the darkness between stars, there are worlds that have lost everything. Planets that wander the void completely alone, 
and they might outnumber all the planets around stars combined. Level 3. Picture a planet. Now remove its star. Remove the sun, the daylight, the seasons, everything. Just a world tumbling through the void completely alone in eternal darkness and cold. These are rogue planets, and they're exactly what they sound like. Planets that have been violently ejected from their solar systems, now drifting through interstellar space with no sun to orbit, no day or night cycle, just infinite frozen darkness. And here's the part that should mess with your head. There might be billions of them. More planets wandering the dark spaces between stars than orbiting stars themselves. How does this cosmic exile happen? During the chaotic early days of a solar system's formation, gravitational interactions between planets can get violent. Picture a game of cosmic pinball where one planet's orbit destabilizes another. Gravitational slingshots fling planets outward at escape velocity, sending them careening into the void. These orphaned worlds drift through the galaxy in total isolation, their surfaces frozen into solid blocks of ice, their atmospheres collapsed and frozen solid on the ground. Any life that might have existed would be extinct within years as temperatures plummet to just above absolute zero. Except here's where it gets fascinating. Large planets can stay warm from radioactive decay in their cores for billions of years. If they had subsurface oceans before ejection, those oceans might remain liquid beneath kilometers of ice, warmed from below by the planet's dying heat. Life could theoretically survive down there in those dark seas, completely cut off from the rest of the universe, existing in permanent night, never seeing a star, never knowing that stars even exist. From planets with no sun to planets that are basically Earth on an absolutely terrifying amount of steroids. Worlds where gravity itself becomes a prison. Level 4. Earth is a terrestrial planet, but what if Earth decided to hit the gym and never stopped? Super-Earths are rocky planets on steroids, typically between 1.5 and 10 times Earth's mass. They're bigger, denser, and their gravity is absolutely crushing. Standing on a super-Earth twice Earth's mass, you'd weigh twice as much. Jumping would feel like you're wearing a weighted vest filled with concrete. And here's the kicker. They're everywhere. Super-Earths are the most common type of planet we've discovered around other stars, which is bizarre because our solar system doesn't have any. These planets blur the line between terrestrial worlds and many gas giants. Some might have thick hydrogen atmospheres. Others could be scaled-up versions of Earth with massive oceans covering their entire surfaces. But here's where super-Earths get really interesting. Plate tectonics. On Earth, our shifting crustal plates are crucial for regulating climate and maintaining conditions for life. On a super-Earth, the increased gravity and pressure might make plate tectonics impossible, locking the planet into a stagnant lid regime where the crust never moves. Or the opposite could be true. Hyperactive tectonics with constant volcanic eruptions. And then there's the subset that might be ocean worlds. Planets where the entire surface is covered in liquid water hundreds of miles deep. No continents, no islands, no land whatsoever. Just a global ocean from pole to pole. The pressure at the bottom would be so intense that water would compress into exotic forms of ice that only exist at high pressure and high temperature simultaneously. Hot ice, sitting at the bottom of an ocean. Super-Earths are massive, but they're still just rocky planets. What happens when you scale up even further? When a planet gets so big it almost becomes something else entirely? Welcome to the realm of the failed stars. Level 5. Jupiter and Saturn. The undisputed heavyweights of our solar system. Jupiter is so massive that 1,300 Earths could fit inside it, and yet it's still mostly just atmosphere. There's no solid surface to land on. If you tried, you'd just keep sinking, the pressure mounting, the temperature rising, until you were crushed and incinerated somewhere in the depths of an endless, swirling atmosphere. These planets are basically failed stars. If Jupiter had been about 80 times more massive, it would have ignited nuclear fusion in its core and become a star itself. As it stands, Jupiter still radiates more heat than it receives from the Sun, slowly contracting and releasing gravitational energy accumulated from its formation. The Great Red Spot on Jupiter is a storm larger than Earth that's been raging for at least 350 years, possibly much longer. The wind speeds reach 270 miles per hour at the edges, and the whole thing rotates counterclockwise every six days. It's shrinking, though, getting smaller year by year, and Nobody knows if it'll eventually dissipate or restabilize. Saturn holds the title of least dense planet in our solar system. Its average density is actually less than water, which means if you had a bathtub big enough, Saturn would float. Those magnificent rings are made of ice particles ranging from dust-sized grains to chunks as large as mountains, all orbiting in a disk that's barely 30 feet thick in some places, despite being 175,000 miles wide. Gas giants are massive and chaotic. 
but at least they maintain some distance from their stars. But what if a planet got so close to its sun that the entire surface melted into an ocean of liquid rock? Level 6. Imagine a planet so close to its star that its entire surface is an ocean of molten rock. These lava worlds orbit their stars in a matter of hours, sometimes less than a day, locked in such a tight gravitational embrace that tidal forces have stretched them into egg shapes. The day side faces permanent nuclear hell, heated to temperatures where rock flows like water and the atmosphere is made of vaporized minerals. Kepler-10b completes an orbit around its star in just 20 hours. Its surface temperature is estimated at 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt iron. The entire planet might have a magma ocean hundreds of miles deep, constantly churning with a thin crust that cracks and reforms like the skin on cooling lava. On these worlds, it doesn't rain water. It rains rocks. Vaporized minerals in the atmosphere condense and fall as pebbles of corundum, the same material that makes rubies and sapphires. The weather forecast is partly cloudy with a chance of gemstones. Extreme heat warning and effect indefinitely. Lava worlds are made of the same basic ingredients as Earth. Silicon, oxygen, iron. But what if a planet formed from an entirely different recipe? What if instead of rock, a world was built from pure carbon? Level 7. Earth is made mostly of silicate rocks, oxygen, iron, the standard planetary ingredients. But what if a planet formed in a region of space where carbon was more abundant than oxygen? You'd get a carbon planet, and it would be alien in the truest sense of the word. Instead of silicate minerals, these planets would have carbide rocks. Silicon carbide and titanium carbide make up the crust, hard and dark. Instead of a metal core, they might have a core of solid diamond or graphite, kilometers thick. If they had oceans, they wouldn't be water. They might be tar or crude oil, thick and black. The atmosphere of a carbon world could be filled with carbon monoxide, methane, and hydrocarbons, creating a permanent smog. Lightning strikes would produce soot. Volcanoes would erupt with liquid carbon and graphite instead of basaltic lava. 55 Cancri E is a prime candidate. It's a super-Earth orbiting so close to its star that its year lasts only 18 hours, and spectral analysis suggests it might have a carbon-rich composition. If true, its interior could contain more diamond than all of Earth's crust combined. The really mind-bending part is thinking about whether life could exist in such a world. Carbon is the basis of life as we know it, but carbon-based life on a carbon planet would be chemistry operating under completely different rules. Carbon worlds are alien, but they're still intact, still whole, but some planets aren't so lucky. Some have been slowly murdered by their own stars, stripped down to their skeletal cores. Level 8. These are the skeletal remains of planets that used to be massive, but got too close to their stars and paid the ultimate price. A Thonian planet starts life as a hot Jupiter, a gas giant orbiting dangerously close to its star. Over millions of years, the intense stellar radiation strips away the outer layers of the atmosphere. The hydrogen and helium that made the planet giant are blown into space by the solar wind, peeled away layer by layer until only the dense rocky or metallic core remains. What you end up with is a super dense, super hot core, sometimes just a fraction of its original size, scorched and barren. It's planetary death in slow motion. Kepler 52b might be a Chthonian planet. It orbits its star every 7.8 hours at a distance of just 2 million miles. The surface temperature is estimated at over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and if it once had an atmosphere, it's long gone now. These are the ghosts of planets killed by their stars. But there's something even more disturbing. Planets that orbit the corpses of stars themselves. Worlds bathed in radiation from the spinning remains of a stellar explosion. Level 9. When a massive star dies in a supernova, sometimes its core collapses into a neutron star. A city-sized object so dense that a teaspoon of its material would weigh a billion tons. Some spin hundreds of times per second, emitting beams of radiation from their magnetic poles. These are pulsars and sometimes impossibly they have planets. These pulsar planets shouldn't exist. The supernova that created the pulsar should have destroyed any planets in the system. Yet we've found them, small worlds orbiting the rapidly spinning corpses of dead stars, bathed in lethal radiation. The first confirmed exoplanets ever discovered were pulsar planets, orbiting PSR B 1257 plus 12 in 1992. There are three of them, two roughly Earth-sized and one about the mass of the moon. They're likely made of the ashes of the supernova itself. Second-generation planets formed from the debris disk after the star's death. Standing on a pulsar planet, you wouldn't see the sun. You'd see a small, dim object barely visible, emitting almost no visible light. But the radiation levels would kill you in microseconds. 
These are planets in name only, hellscapes orbiting a cosmic graveyard. You think orbiting a dead star is extreme? We're about to enter territory where the laws of physics themselves start to bend. Planets so strange they shouldn't be possible at all. Level 10. Now we venture into the realm of planets that push the boundaries of physics into territories that seem like science fiction. Coreless planets. Planets with no metallic core at all, just layers of ice and rock all the way through. These would have weak or non-existent magnetic fields, leaving them vulnerable to stellar radiation stripping away their atmospheres. Iron planets. Planets that are almost entirely metal, iron, and nickel cores exposed to space with little to no rocky mantle. Mercury is partially like this with an unusually large iron core making up 70% of its mass. And then there's the most extreme, a planet orbiting a black hole. In Interstellar, they depicted Miller's planet orbiting close to a supermassive black hole, where time dilation meant one hour on the surface equaled seven years elsewhere. While the movie took creative liberties, the physics isn't entirely impossible. A planet orbiting in the habitable zone of a black hole would need to be far enough away to avoid being torn apart by tidal forces, but close enough that hawking radiation could provide warmth. You'd be orbiting in permanent darkness, no sun, no stars visible beyond the distortion of space-time around the black hole. Any light would come from the accretion disk, superheated matter spiraling into the black hole, creating a glow like a demonic halo. The sky would be a twisted funhouse mirror of gravitationally lensed light. Would life be possible? Maybe. But it would be life that evolved in the shadow of a cosmic monster, clinging to existence in one of the most extreme environments the universe can create. From the familiar rocks of Earth to diamond rain on Neptune, from rogue planets wandering the void to worlds orbiting dead stars, the universe has created a diversity of worlds that exceeds anything our ancestors imagined. And here's the thing. We've only discovered about 5,000 exoplanets so far. There are an estimated 100 billion planets in our galaxy alone. We've sampled 0.000005% of them, which means somewhere out there, there might be a planet type so strange, so fundamentally different from anything on this list, that when we finally detect it, we'll have to invent entirely new categories just to describe what we're seeing. The universe isn't done surprising us, it's just getting started.